Well, welcome everyone. Um, if, uh, if you can please just take a seat. Uh, I'd like to, uh, just to start off the event, I'd like to invite uh, Nathan Elstrad and Gloria Partita to just give some welcoming remarks. There, there you go. Uh, welcome to the third annual Breaking the Silence uh, put on by the, David, the City of Davis Human Relations Commission. I'm Gloria Partita and I am a uh, commissioner on the human relations. And uh, we, I'm going to turn this over to Nathan because he really knows the history of this event. And, but I'd also like to say thank you to my fellow commissioners and to Kelly, where's Kelly? Is she? <laughs> there she is. She's in the back. Uh, who have put a lot of work into this, and uh, we're really hoping uh, that people will take something away from this and that you will feel like your voices are being heard today. And I'm Nathan Elstrand. Thank you so much for coming. So I'm also a commissioner on the City of Davis Human Relations Commission. And so just to give you a brief history of this event, so why does this event exist? So this is the third annual Breaking the Silence. The first took place in 2012, following the discovery of a noose at Davis High School. So the community got together and wanted to respond to that incident. Um, and as a result, that brought about the first Breaking the Silence. We had over 200 people at that first event, and it was quite the success really focused on providing a forum for the community and almost in a sense of a reverse panel, having the community speak towards representatives of institutions. We did, the second year we did that was in 2013. In 2013, um, we changed the format a, a bit, really focusing a little more on community organizations as well. And so this year, <laughs> we wanted to do that uh, once more. So as you saw from 1 to 1.30 was that opportunity to see community organizations that are really working towards social justice here in Davis and the community at large. And then we will have uh, this forum right now from 1.30 to 3. So we're gonna provide opportunity, as Ori will say in a second, for the panel to say a bit, and then we'll open up to all of you. So thank you very much for coming and appreciate having you here. Thank you. So uh, welcome, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for this uh, community conversation. My name is Orit Kalman, and I'm one of the founders and executive director of the YOLO Conflict Resolution Center. It's a new organization that uh, promotes safe conversations and conflict resolution practices. Uh, before we start today, just in terms of logistics, uh, if you brought your cell phone, if you could silence it so we can really focus on each other as a community. Uh, also at the back we have uh, Maria, so if you need uh, translation uh, assistance, uh, she's in the back uh, uh, ready to help out. All right. Um, so I, I have to say first that um, we're kind of the new kid on the block and um, a new organization, and I'm quite humbled to be invited to uh, facilitate this conversation today. Uh, but I really want to highlight some of the organizations that are already doing a lot of good work in the community. So uh, if you had a chance, if you were here early, you had a chance to walk around, um, I want to highlight the organization and the representatives here because as we come here and uh, share our experiences um, and our stories, it's also important to remember that there's a lot of good work also. People are really doing good work here. And uh, if there's opportunity, if you have a particular passion for something, uh, it's an opportunity to connect with those organizations. And I encourage you to speak to the um, representative here. So we, I'm just going to call out the organization, if you don't mind just uh, standing up so everybody can see who you are. Uh, we have um, Helen Rowland from the Celebration of Abraham. Thank you. Uh, we have Gloria Partita from uh, the Davis Phoenix Coalition. And Frankie J. Woods from Future Development Youth Center. Thank you. Alexandra Lee Jobes from Uniting for Racial Justice at the Unitarian Universal. Universalist Church of Davis. 
Uh, we have Elia Garcia, one of our founding and board member at Yolo Conflict Resolution Center. And we have Isaiah Jurado and Betsy Thomas from the Culture Co-op. So uh, thank you uh, for being here uh, and representing your organization. And uh, please, at the end of the event, if you have a chance, go and, and speak with these people who are already doing great work in our community. So uh, as I said, I'm grateful to be able to facilitate. I um, want to make sure uh, Kelly, where is she? Uh, yes, want to give you a, a thank you and to the Human Relations Commissioner, Commissioners Nathan Elstrand, Leanne Friedman, Gloria Fertitta, and Yvonne Clinton, who helped put this event together. Um, and thank you for the panelists for being here and uh, providing your organization perspective and for being witness to our conversation today. Also, I want to uh, let you know we have Allison Kent in the back, and she will be recording our stories today. And we look forward to opportunities to following the event to showcase uh, some of the stories and, and what we're creating here. We're here for just an hour and a half, and it'll be wonderful if community members who are unable to be here today are still getting uh, a glimpse into what we're doing today. So thank you, Allison, for being here and for the beautiful uh, work of art. So uh, in our conflict resolution uh, services, we um, were really based on restorative practices and principles, and we emphasize people's uh, capacity to affect change through dialogue and share understanding. And so the ideas are always that a conversation is when people get to share their own stories, and when we share stories together, we really expand our understanding and the lenses through which we see things. And only when we do that, when we have a shared story as a community, can we move forward and make change and make a difference. And so I really think of this conversation as a very restorative practice because we are coming as a community to share stories, to have a better shared understanding of who we are as a community and give us the opportunity then to move uh, forward. So this is the third year that the community is invited for this conversation. And as you mentioned, Nathan, uh, it started with uh, racism. And th this year, we're really expanding the focus of the conversation. Uh, so the topic is, di uh, is um, discrimination, uh, hate-related activities, and indifference. And so this is an opportunity to really uh, embrace uh, all people of our community as we have a conversation. Um, coming up here and speaking can be uh, sometimes intimidating. We're talking about personal stories. Uh, we become very vulnerable when we open up like that. Uh, but it is a gift to all of us. So I encourage all of you uh, as we uh, open it up for conversation and for sharing that uh, you'd be generous with your life stories and share them with us so we can all learn together. Um, we say in conflict resolution that when you walk through the door, this is your first step in a process. Uh, you may not feel ready to come and speak up, but coming in here is, a, is that commitment that, you think, that you're making to your community that this is an important conversation. So before we get going with the event itself, um, uh, why don't we spend just a few minutes, turn to someone sitting next to you, introduce yourself, uh, let them know why you're here, what are your hopes for the next hour and a half, and then we'll reconvene. The acoustics back there are very bad, and I, so I missed some of the organizations, if you could just give them in the order that you gave them. So I have the City of Davis Human Rights Commission. Here, 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 here. Celeste. Thank you. Way 
away from everybody, oh. but, but I want to see the panelists, so I hope she stays here. <laughs> oh, well, you could come sit here. Did you have a chance to talk with someone? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I said hi to them. Yeah, I mean, I've said hi to all these okay. people already today, and then I said hi to a couple others. All right, excellent. So, Mm. It's hard to start a, a conversation and, and have to end it within a few, few minutes. So the nice thing about having these little conversations is right away you can feel the energy in the room rise up, this, this instant connection when you turn to someone and, and, and you share who you are and your story. So just to uh, give you a sense of what we're going to do today, we have until uh, 3 o'clock for this event. And um, we have here just kind of a, an outline of what we're going to do. So we're going to start with our uh, panel presentation and uh, going to give a chance to each panel uh, member, I'll introduce them, and uh, give them a chance to give uh, their organization or perspective. And then uh, we'll invite the community to come up and uh, share stories. Uh, we'll give you some prompts for things to talk about, and I'll discuss a little bit more uh, what the sharing is going to look like. And then we're going to follow up the last 15 minutes where we're going to ask the panel then to uh, come back and, and kind of give a collective response to what they've heard. So because we don't have a lot of time, um, I've asked the panel to just <coughs> hold off with responses until the end. So we can get as many people to uh, speak up and, uh, and share before 3 o'clock. And then what we'll do at 3 o'clock is we're going to break for 10 minutes, and the program will end. Uh, I encourage you to fill out uh, evaluations. This is an annual event, so we'd like to hear what you think of the event, how we can improve. So. Uh, fill out an evaluation, maybe visit again with the organization. And then those who wish to stay and continue in a more informal conversations are invited to stay here for another hour until 4 o'clock, and we will continue a conversation um, as, as, as um, community members like to do. Um, so that's, that's kind of the flow of um, what we're going to do today. Um, before I introduce the, the panelists, uh, I just wanted to let you know what is the question that we had asked the panelists to uh, respond to. We asked them, uh, what specific action has your agency or organization taken in the last year to address community issues related to indifference, discrimination, and violence based upon hate? And um, I'm going to... Um, start with <laughs> on this side and, and we'll work our way. Uh, each one has about three to five minutes to share their perspective. And uh, we'll start with uh, Daryl Patel, Assistant Chief of Police, the Davis Police Department. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I'm Darren Patel. I'm the Assistant Chief, Davis Police Department. And I've been with the police department since 1987 and worked a, a variety of assignments. So thank you for having me here today. You know, on the issue of hate crimes, um, in some cases, the, the police department, it's kind of obvious what it is that we do. Um, we're often the, the first stop that uh, when hate incidents or crimes do occur in Davis, people call us. And, uh, you know, they expect a, a complete and thorough investigation. Um, and we actually do that. So the standard protocol, anytime somebody calls in with any kind of uh, discrimination, hate crime case, the investigations lieutenant is immediately notified. So even though a, a patrol officer may be the initial responding person, they're actually required to call um, 
the investigations lieutenant, one of the administrators, and then a announcement goes out to the rest of the administrative team. And we do that so that we ensure that we um, dedicate adequate resources to investigate the crime. Oftentimes it's really important that the initial response, um, we do a real good job of, of getting information from victims and witnesses do neighborhood canvases, uh, make sure that we collect any kind of physical evidence. But oftentimes time is of the essence in order to make sure that we, we get everything that it is we need to do that uh, criminal investigation. And then we follow that up with a notification to our community. And we think that it's real important that when we do have a, an incident of discrimination or of hate, that we actually do notice the community of what's going on. Don't try to hide it, don't try to sweep it underneath the rug, but make sure that, that everybody knows what's going on. And we do that for a variety of reasons. One, so that if anybody does have information about uh, what occurred and, uh, you know, or starts hearing things, you now with the, the days of Facebook, sometimes information is out there pretty quick. But oftentimes we want to make sure that, that we um, get the information back to us so that we can proceed with an investigation, look at all avenues. We also think it's real important that the community take us an active stand against hate and discrimination. And the community has to know that it occurs in order to take that active stand. You'll notice that the, the recent incidents of, of um, hate crimes, the community was really quick to respond. They were really quick to denounce what occurred. And we think that that's real important in sending a message that it's not gonna be tolerated here and we don't want it here. So in short, that's kind of uh, what we do with the, the hate crimes and discrimination. And then secondly, let's face it, in uh, some communities, the police are also a flashpoint for claims of discrimination and we can't ignore that. And so you asked what, what's different or what we've been working on. Um, Back in, uh, and we just uh, recently announced a, a new conflict resolution program with the, the police department. So a little bit of history on that. Back in uh, 2013, uh, the Human Relations Commission appointed a, a subcommittee and then uh, got several community, um, in some cases activists or just longstanding community members to come in and work with five police department employees and address the issue of how is it that we can, we can um, build trust with uh, various segments of the community, sometimes uh, minority, and sometimes um, just people that have had some negative experiences with the police department. We work through about a year process of identifying ways that we could work better with the community. Everything from doing informal coffees to hosting uh, larger community meetings and making sure that, that we do discuss areas of conflict when they arise. And we can do that, and probably the best time to do it is following national incidents or statewide incidents that create a concern with law enforcement. We know that that's actually a really good time to have a conversation in our community. One of the things that we did recognize was that when there is a, a national incident or a statewide incident, something that puts police on the radar that it's oftentimes followed up with some sort of local connection or local thoughts and feelings. And you know, the best time for the police department, for us to get up and talk about our policies and procedures and what it is that we do here is uh, following some sort of situation somewhere else. Because you know, if the, the situation occurs here in Davis, there's a little bit of a tendency to kind of dig in and, and not really talk as uh, candidly as we can when something happens somewhere else. So we think that that's a real good, good way to spark community conversations. But probably the most important thing that the, the group worked on was an alternative conflict resolution program. And we know that uh, people do file complaints against police department employees. And, we need, and uh, throughout the years we've noticed that not everybody is completely satisfied with the, the way that we resolve citizen complaints. Um, Oftentimes the, the police department ourselves were investigating the complaints. There's no community involvement in our complaint process. And you know, people really kind of walk away because oftentimes, although a complete and thorough investigation has been done, people are just feeling that their voices actually weren't heard by the, the police department employee that worked with them out on the street or dealt with them out on the street. And, and oftentimes people walk away with, still that initial conflict that just was never resolved. 
So the group, uh, we work through a process um, ourselves, the, a circle process, which is a, sort of a restorative process. And, and basically the, the process that was just described a, a few minutes ago uh, with us in this room. But what it is is when somebody has a grievance against a police department employee, uh, rather than doing just a, a formal investigation, the employee and the, the person um, who has the complaint, they can meet together using a circle process, using trained community facilitators, community members to act as facilitators and work through the conflict, um, engage in actual face-to-face -face dialogue. And the hopefully the outcome is that people walk away with better feelings about what occurred out on the street when there's oftentimes not that same time to work through the, the problems. So we're actually really excited about, about this. Uh, more to come on that. We'll be going before the city council on Tuesday night and explaining the, the entire process. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. And next we have uh, Dr. Raheem Reed from UC Davis, Associate Executive Vice Chancellor, Campus Community Relations. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you and uh, members of the Davis Human Relations Commission uh, and members of the community for uh, for sponsoring this and coming out and supporting uh, this program. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to participate uh, in the past, and so I welcome the opportunity to uh, participate this afternoon with you here. Uh, in terms of some of the things that have been going on on the campus and how we've responded over this past year or so uh, about uh, incidences of hate and bias and the like, uh, I would start off by uh, saying to you that um, one of the uh, strongest uh, uh, things that we have in our campus community to support our efforts in building a more welcoming, supportive, and inclusive campus community uh, are our principles of community. Uh, and uh, if you'll recall back in 1990, uh, the University of California Davis, along with the city of Davis, and the Davis Joint Unified School District uh, promulgated a set of principles of community. Um, in April of this year, uh, we will be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Principles of Community Statement at, uni at the University of California Davis, and we have spent the past year uh, preparing ourselves for that. So how do we celebrate our Principles of Community? Well, the first thing that we did was we recognized that the Principles of Community have served us very well over the last 25 years. It set a tone for what we value in our community. It set a tone for how we want to interact with one another in our community, uh, how we want to respect one another, how we want to promote a very robust uh, environment for the discussion of differences, different opinions, different thoughts, different attitudes, different perspectives, different cultures and the like. But we want to do it in a very civil and a very respectful way. Um, we recognize that our principles of community, although they've served us well over the last 25 years, that in fact, you, the UC Davis campus today in 2015 is different than the UC Davis campus was in 1990. We're much larger and we're ver very much more diverse in all of the indices of diversity, uh, whether it's racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, the like of uh, international students, uh, you name it, we've grown to be a very, very diverse uh, and large university. So we set about this year in editing the Principles of Community Statement for the first time in 25 years and making that document or bringing that document forward so it reflects what we look like and what we value uh, in 2015. Um, as I said, the statement has served us very well, so we did not set about to totally revise uh, that statement, but simply to edit it and to create um, a more welcoming, inclusive document so that those who have joined our community over the last 25 years will feel welcome. This is something that uh, we'll be doing uh, uh, all year long. We'll be doing a number of different programs on our campus uh, in celebration of our principles of community. And I'm hoping that the Davis community uh, will participate and join in that, whether it's speakers or folks we bring in or exhibits or film of the, uh, or any sort of educational enterprise that we engage in. I hope you will join us. Uh, we uh, recognize that we're a part of the Davis community. I've often said that um, uh, the various streets that border uh, the campus and the community are not barriers. Uh, you can freely cross 
from one side to the other, from one community to the other community. And so it behooves us to make sure that the things that we're doing are shared with the community uh, at large. Uh, recently, uh, we've had some incidences occur on our campus around uh, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, uh, and uh, they've been very challenging for us to deal with. Uh, and in the true spirit of our principles of community and recognizing that we are one community, uh, we have uh, asked uh, members of the community to join us in building the kind of foundation we need to uh, address this challenge and to begin some real healing on our campus. So um, the chancellor uh, a week or so ago sent a letter out to the entire campus community uh, 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 condemning first the acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that had occurred uh, and then uh, setting up a committee uh, chaired by uh, the vice chancellor for student affairs, Adela De La Torre, and uh, myself, uh, but inviting members of the campus community to join us. And in particular, we asked uh, Helen Wollen um, and Kim Trupp, uh, from uh, Salam, uh, the Sacramento Area League of American uh, Muslims, uh, and Rabbi Greg Wolf uh, to join us because they have all been uh, major uh, players uh, with Helen in the uh, celebration of Abraham, in which we uh, celebrate um, uh, the three major monolithic faiths, uh, uh, patriarch uh, Abraham. Uh, and they have done a great deal of work in building the kinds of bridges, the interfaith bridges uh, that we think are going to be very important to us moving forward in healing our community. Uh, we recognize that the issues that impact our community are not all faith-based, that there are issues that go beyond that. But to be frank about it, we were looking for some common ground, a common starting point. Uh, and we could think of no better common ground or starting point than to use uh, those folks who have been doing work in the interfaith community for a number of years and have done it successfully, to ask them to join us and to partner with us uh, in moving forward. So we'll be moving forward with uh, discussions uh, with that group. Uh, our next meeting will include a number of students uh, because Students' lives are at the heart of this. Uh, student lives matter a great deal to us and their welfare and their well-being and creating an environment in which they can learn and be very productive. So they'll be joining us shortly and we'll begin to develop some program initiatives around uh, that area. I won't go on into a number of other uh, things that are ongoing. I think they'll come up later. But one of the things I would like to touch on that uh, was uh, mentioned in terms of our police department uh, we do have in place this year what we call a police accountability board. Uh, and it's a board that we put together to uh, directly deal with uh, citizen complaints of misconduct by our police department. Uh, it is a board made up of uh, faculty, staff, and students from across the campus. Uh, and, uh, and we work directly with the UC Davis Police Department uh, in dealing with uh, complaints uh, of alleged misconduct of our police officers. Uh, the uh, first series of uh, cases are uh, making their way through that system right now. Uh, we hope for it to be a very successful and very transparent uh, process and one that will restore some uh, trust and faith uh, in uh, our police uh, and campus community relations. Uh, and so I'll stop at that point uh, and uh, give my other colleagues a chance to make some remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and next we have Jennifer Mullen, who's a counselor at the Willett Elementary School and the Da Vinci Charter Academy High School. Hi, everybody. Um, I will try to keep this a little bit brief. Uh, point of being here really awesome. Oh, no. But I do speak loudly, so I'm not so great with a mic. Oh, getcha. Um, so I'll try to keep this a bit short. Uh, we really want to listen and learn from a community about what's happening. And so you've already heard a, a similar theme of restorative. I think every single person has used that same term. Uh, that is the major focus in the school district right now. We, uh, we are working towards uh, building capacity for understanding in the district of restorative practices by training teachers and uh, students actually and staff all the way from the board and the district office through the entire community of the school district. Um, our intention in that is really to make a paradigm shift. So um, it, it's, you'll hear more about it, but it's not um, just a set of tools or a program. It really is a shift in thinking and really um, what you've heard described already, but doing things with one another um, 
to really hear one another. Um, you, the uh, Davis or UC Davis was talking about, you know, really looking to the community to try to um, build that bridge to that uh, to make sure that we can do things positively. Um, but one of the the main reasons is to really open up and create safe spaces for dialogue so that we can have conversations, we can really listen to one another, hear each other's narratives and stories, and learn from one, one another and really understand our impact. Um, and one of the main uh, blatant forms of racism that you'll see within schools is a disproportionate rate of uh, suspensions and expulsions of students of color. Uh, Davis is not apart from that. We also have that disproportionate rate. We are working towards restorative practices. Um, you'll, you'll see in research and um, information that's out there that schools that, and uh, communities that really um, adapt uh, to a restorative mindset and practices, that disproportionate rate decreases. There is a myth out there that that means that kids are not being suspended or that there's no discipline. That actually means there's a, there's a much higher level of accountability when you need to hear someone else's story and really uh, take that in and learn from that. It's also because there is a really strong emphasis on building community and strengthening relationships. And to be real, if you, if you, are, uh, you have a strong relationship with somebody and you really understand that person, there's less harm, number one, but we're humans and so we, do, we are in conflict and we do um, harm one another, but when there is a harm that takes place, there really is an opportunity to listen and learn and grow from that and then restore community um, so that the people that have been harmed and the person that has done the harm really can be less isolated, come together as a community and talk about it, uh, just as this, um, excuse me, space has set up that same um, type of dynamic. So we are not, um, we, we still have further to go. Um, for instance, we, um, though some classrooms did celebrate Black History Month, um, we did not do something collectively as a district. Um, so we still have learning and growing to do. That's something that is um, a particular thing that needed some emphasis. Um, so thank you all um, for, for letting us comment. I think um, I'll probably save a little bit more for later, but. Uh, we do, we understand that we have decreased the, um, the overt racism and discrimination that's visible in the district, but we have further to go as far as indifference and microaggressions are concerned. Um, we, we really, we are trying to help staff and students understand that their bias and power and privilege really um, keeps that indifference alive, and we need to, to change that um, and help people learn, educate them better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we have Madhavi Sunder, who is uh, a board member of the Davis Joint Unified School District. Thank you for being here. Sure. Thank you so much uh, to the Human Rights Commission for organizing this important forum and to all of you for being here. Uh, you know, I'm very new on the Davis School Board, and so uh, I just was elected in November and joined in December. So I thought I would take my time to share with you some of the programs that I learned about on the campaign trail. I had the fortune to visit all 20 of our campuses uh, during the campaign and talk to principals, teachers, students, uh, parents, uh, all sorts of uh, community members and learned a lot. So I just wanted to share some of that. Um, you know, I uh, first it was uh, many community organizations, some of which uh, whose work are featured out front there, including uh, Gloria Partida and the Davis Phoenix Coalition. Um, so just learning about what's happening in the community really emphasized the importance of strengthening our partnerships with these various community groups to uh, make sure that our kids in the joint, Davis Joint Unified Schools have access to programs and, uh, and conversations. Um, I uh, learned through Gloria about the Hate is Not a Davis Value campaign, and Hate is Not a DJUSD Value either. And so I was really heartened to see a lot of the great programs that we have going on, and, and I'll talk at the end about a couple ideas for that are percolating for other things we can do as well. But just to begin, cl school climate is a high priority. Um, in fact, it is the priority. When you talk to principals and teachers, uh, the community recognizes that if students don't feel safe 
and welcome, they cannot learn and thrive. Uh, so um, recognizing that social and emotional wellness is critical to academic success is also part of our district strategic plan. And just school climate really um, entails a lot of things. It's safety, it's your relationships with your peers and your teachers and counselors, it's uh, how we learn what we're learning, um, it's, uh, it, and it's the external environment. So it really, and, and we take this holistic look at what school climate is. Um, so, so some of the things that I saw, I'll start with some elementary school programs and, and move up from there, but recess is what you hear most of all, right? When people are talking about climate and do kids feel safe, do they feel included and welcome? And at some of our elementary schools, there are some really innovative things that are going on at Pioneer Elementary, the parents uh, chose to pay for um, a PE teacher who could work with kids on the playground. Uh, it's called Lunchapalooza. But the idea is having organized games and activities and adult supervision on the playground keeps kids engaged, especially some kids who don't necessarily have an immediate peer group to, to uh, spend time with and socialize with. It draws them in. At um, Chavez Elementary, there's a play works group. Again, it's largely run by parent volunteers. Uh, but they've actually even been able to survey um, their community. They have sixth graders mentoring younger kids, so it's also a leadership opportunity for kids, and the program uh, incorporates PE standards into the games that they do at recess, but they have um, already shown that there's improvement with respect to bullying um, and kids uh, going to the office and, and disciplinary issues. So those kinds of things are happening on the playground, and again, I think as um, Jen Mullen said, if perhaps we could kind of streamline these kinds of pra best practices that work across the district. At M uh, Montgomery Elementary, where we have a high uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged population and a high English language learner population. We also have a family resource center right on campus where, um, and this is a wonderful place where um, fa all different diverse families can come and feel, uh, and, and begin to get, feel more comfortable engaging in the school. The studies all show that the more parents are engaged, the more likely their child is going to succeed. Uh, and uh, we have, um, academic programs there too, two-way bilingual immersion that also are a way to help bring in English language learner families into the school district. We have now our um, local control accountability plan, which is um, all about outreach to the community and bringing in um, the voices of families and, and uh, kids from uh, all uh, uh, different parts of our uh, Davis community. Korematsu Elementary is a school that I was um, had the privilege to be involved in helping to name that school 10 years ago now. Um, but the idea there was um, to, to say, well, what is it? Fred Korematsu, he, he was an American from Oakland who challenged the Japanese internment. And, um, and he really symbolizes this idea that, um, uh, you know, what does it mean to be American? It's not your, the color of your skin or your funny name, but it's uh, the shared values uh, that we all believe in equality and freedom in this country. And that school um, has, is a social justice school. And so, um, and they uh, wear on their t-shirts a quote from Fred Korematsu that says, if you have the feeling something is wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. They've used his story and his legacy to really um, promote anti-bullying uh, and, and awareness of social justice. That's some of the stuff, and I don't want to go on too long, but a couple things at the junior highs. There's a lot of peer uh, mentoring programs that we're seeing at the junior highs where uh, kids are sharing stories about being gay, having two moms, having two dads, uh, what their experiences are in the schools, and, and sharing those stories with each other empowering um, each other to intervene if they see bullying or taunting um, or, or harassment. So um, I, I think I, I love the fact that it's peers helping peers and really learning the skills to intervene at Emerson, Holmes, and Harper, seeing that. We have our race and social justice program at Davis High School a long-standing um, uh, uh, lauded program. as And and now I think that um, uh, several of our panelists have talked about a new direction that we're going, which I think, I hope it sounds very promising, restorative justice uh, programs, especially uh, when you look at the literature on the school to prison pipeline and how and what is one effective way of breaking out of that, uh, the, the um, idea of restorative justice, bringing the parties together to come up with, uh, to, to help um, uh, develop mutual understanding, uh, all of that is, is um, stuff that I think would be great. So I, I have more examples, but really, as uh, Jen Mullen said, we're here to hear stories, so I'm just grateful um, that you're all here to share.
Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing your um, organization perspective. And it's interesting, the thread of community engagement and the importance of uh, letting people's voice be heard uh, as a way to move forward in mending relationships and building a better future. Thank you. So we're going to move to uh, the, next, uh, the next part, where we all get to share our uh, story. And uh, in an effort of creating this safe space for our conversation, I wanted to suggest some guidelines for conversation. So in terms of just the logistics of it, uh, we have a microphone uh, at the podium that you can go and speak to. We also have uh, these wandering microphones if you prefer to stay where you are and we can bring the microphone to you. Um, if you're not comfortable speaking up, feel free at any time to just go over to the board, pick up a marker, and, and just write a comment or share um, a story that you may have. So just another way of connecting with everyone. When you're speaking to the microphone, make sure you're really speaking to it so your words are recorded. Um, and uh, in terms of just the sharing, we ask that you speak from the heart, that this is your story, tell it as it comes from you. And we are committing to listening uh, from the heart. You know, we all have different stories and voices. Uh, so, so take a moment to just clear your head and just let things uh, to come in as you hear somebody else's story. Um, we sometimes worry that we won't have the right words, but trust that whatever you need to say will just come out in, in your story. And uh, say just enough. Remember that we're trying to get everybody, as many people as we can, to come up for the three minutes. So really stick to the three minutes. And uh, we have the timer, and we have Talia, who's going to enforce the time. So it, when, you, when the timer starts, it'll be green. And then when you have a minute left, it will go yellow and then red when your time is up. So we just ask that you honor that as, as you come up. And. Let's see. Um, Kelly, I think we need for this, ready for this to be up, yeah. So I, I had a slide for the prompt for the sharing, but Allison did such a beautiful job. I just figured we might as well use her. Uh... <coughs> so there are three questions uh, that, that we ask, and you can, you can attend to any of them uh, as, as you see fit. One is share your personal experience as it relates to discrimination, hate-motivated actions, or indifference in Davis. Um, the second one is uh, share the impact that it, that experience may have had on you or others. Uh, sometimes as bystander, we're really affected by what we see in front of us. Uh, so share any personal impacts. And uh, lastly, if you have any ideas for change, what, what should we do as a community? What can we do as a community? Um, to address these issues. So they're here for you, so you can just uh, refer to them, the personal experience, the impact, and ideas for change. And so now we're going to open the floor. Anyone wants to be the first to share? Thank you. So if you can, just uh, say your name, and then Talia will start the timer for you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rick Gonzalez. I'm the president of the Mexican American Concilio of Yolo County. Um, I just want to give you a little historical perspective because I've been here so darn long. Uh, I came to Davis in 1975 uh, when uh, uh, Tong was, uh, was shot at the high school uh, in 83. The result of that was the formation of this same Human Relations Commission that brings you this meeting today. I was one of the, the, found, the one of the first ones that were that served on, as the uh, on the uh, Human Relations Commission. Then we hired Elvia, if you remember, 50 years ago. She was the first Human Relations Coordinator in the state of California. Uh, and the result of this, uh, after we formed up, uh, was in response to the to the killing at the high school. Uh, but what brought us together was a group of students from UC Davis, a group of African-American students who came to the city council and 
and stormed in and said they want to know why the police were following them and why they'd go into the stores they wouldn't serve them and why 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 so the city council gave us the uh the uh, uh duty to to do a year survey and uh, so our, i was the chair at the time of the human relations commission we did a full year uh talking to school district talking to well we no actually we were talking to people and they brought all these issues about the schools well we had no jurisdiction over the schools the result of that was we started we started a report that was written by mr john meyer who was our city manager at the time now then he went to uc davis he just retired he wrote a very comprehensive report of 50 recommendations it was called racial issues of 1989 you remember it uh, and that document had 50 recommendations, and so I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. If you could find that document, some of those uh, recommendations have been implemented, some have not. But to reinvent the wheel and to talk about all the stories, because we heard, we, we spent a whole year talking to the community, talking to the police department, talking to the newspapers, talking to the university, uh, talking to people, talking to, you know, whoever would, would come and, you know, we would have these meetings and people would just come and, and they wanted to let us know. So, as a result of that, we made 10 recommendations to the school district, which was the prelude to the human relations committees that came and evolved into the, into the climate committees. We even started the climate uh, position at the high school. In the police department, we found out that they were all white. So we wanted to bring some diversity to the, to the, to the police department. Uh, and so these 50 recommendations were all very well thought out. Uh, John Meyer did a tremendous job writing this report. And it's still around. I, Kelly, I was asking Kelly just for it. It's been around collecting dust for so long since 1989. <laughs> but it is, is valid in, 19, in 2015 as it was in 1989 when we put it together. So, you know, if you could sort of look at that and see the perspective, you know, you're going to find out it's the same thing you, that you're talking about now. So my suggestion is that you, you know, if you could look at, the, get that document, sort of edit it or upgrade it. In fact, as a result of that 1989 report is the, is the UC Davis's community uh, principles of community. That was a result of that, of that report that we did back in 1989. So it has implications for the whole city, for the, for the school district, and for everybody. So uh, what, what and my question now is that you've had uh, breaking the silence one, breaking the I, breaking the silence two. What's what are we doing? Just making a report? Are we going to have some action items? Are we going to letting people more people know? I remember when we used to come here and five people would show up. We get more people coming. There's more interest. But what is the next step? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. What is the follow-up? Oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is David Greenwald. I didn't really plan this, but uh, I guess I have a response for uh, Rick. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, Darren talked about at the beginning uh, is the police community uh, mediations. And anyone who's around Tuesday night uh, should come down to uh, uh, these chambers uh, around 8 o'clock, probably get there a little bit early. Sometimes this council uh, goes quicker than expected. Uh, but uh, they're going to be talking uh, and unrolling that whole package. And that came out of the work uh, of the Human Relations Commission uh, from 2013. Um, part of that came out of... Uh, what we had done at the first breaking of the, uh, the silence uh, of racism event. Um, the idea is that if you go back to 2006, um, a whole bunch of people in the community had come forward uh, with police complaints. And unfortunately, things escalated in the community. I'm sure a lot of you remember uh, back then. Uh, and the Human Relations Commission uh, had to be shut down. Well, in 2013, in May, uh, there was an incident. Uh, there was an African-American gentleman in his 60s. Uh, he was mowing his lawn in West Davis. Um, and a police officer approached him and asked him uh, you know, what he was doing there, if he lived there, and uh, asked for his ID. Now, he's out front of his, his yard. He wrote a letter to the editor of the Enterprise, kind of complaining about the incident. 
And so we were very concerned as a commission about uh, hearing things like that. Um, we had heard, and I've personally heard over the years, number of complaints about racial profiling. And racial profiling is a really difficult thing to get to the bottom of because there are often le legitimate reasons why the police are pulling someone over. If you're driving around at night, I've been on a lot of ride-alongs, you can't see into a car. So uh, it, it's hard to to see the race of the occupant, but maybe they're looking at older model cars or cars that aren't around, but the perception is there. And, and there are people, I know people that, uh, you know, they've been pulled over 10, 20, 30 times. And, you know, the first few times they're probably pretty polite and then each time they get pulled over after that, uh, there's anger building up. That gentleman had probably uh, encountered enough stuff in, over the course of his lifetime that this incident finally set him out. He was, by all accounts, a very quiet, unassuming guy. And for him to write a letter, uh, he had to feel a, a serious indignity. Um, and so what we've created, hopefully, is a way for people like that to be able to talk with the officer involved in a mediated session where they're safe, where they don't have, uh, where they're on equal footing, and be able to figure out what happened and maybe, uh, maybe move on. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe they agree to disagree. Uh, but at least it gives us an opportunity to do something other than file a complaint or file a lawsuit. Thank you. I am from, I'm Teresa Geimer and I'm from South Davis and um, I just want to, an experience that I had um, driving, riding the bus to Sacramento where I worked and I got to know this man who was originally from India and he was telling me about how he would have these things happen to him and, and I just, you know, I couldn't believe it because, you know, Davis is perfect and so... <laughs> Um, but then when he had moved and I saw him downtown, I said, oh, how do you like where you're living? And he's in Sacramento. And he said, oh, it's much better. I'm not being, um, you know, people aren't saying things or whatever. You know, I really can't remember what the things were, but it was just a day-to-day -day thing um, with him. And, and I was really surprised Sacramento's better. You know, I, I just couldn't believe that. And so, um, so what happened, too, is I was in this class and um, it was, you know, months long kind of workshop type of thing. And I had to work with these other groups of people there. And we didn't get to pick our groups. It was just there. And I'm a uh, civil engineer. And this one uh, guy didn't really care for civil, women civil engineers, I found out. Other women that, and none, I was the only woman civil engineer there. The other women didn't have any problem with him. But I kept getting digs all the time. And I talked to the other women in our group, and they didn't see it at all because it wasn't happening to them. And the light came on. If it doesn't happen to you, these subtle things, you don't see them. But if it's happening to you, it's a slap in the face each time. And um, so, if you know, just like what David said, you know, the speaker before me, a lifetime of that, I had one class, and I decided not to do anything about it because, you know, how do you explain it, you know? <laughs> Um, but it wasn't my whole life. I knew that class would end, and I would never have to work with this guy again. And so that's a difference. Uh, the other issue I want to bring, and so what I want to bring up about that is what it did to me is I want to make sure I'm not doing that. Because I think that the guy who was doing that to me and the people that were doing it to my friend on the bus, they may not even realize that they were doing it because it's so subtle, and it's just what you were brought up with. Um, so now that I have that awareness, the, you know, I'm working on that and making sure I'm not doing it, and hopefully I'm not. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is in the Davis Enterprise, twice um, from the DA's office, there was an article about um, a specific case, and they were talking about all the crimes this person had made, you know, two articles, so two separate people. And in both, um, in one of those cases, I knew what was going on, and um, basically lies were said in that article because they said this person had done all these crimes. Well, that person I know had, had gotten a, their own um, investigator and was able to prove that they didn't do 
uh, some of the crimes that they, and I say they had to prove their innocence on those crimes. And uh, this was a person of color also. And so he proved that, but still, after, you know, the, he was still convicted of one crime, but the others he was uh, found innocent from, and still the article was saying he was, he was convicted of all these things, so that was wrong. Then the other one, again, was talking about how this um, other uh, person was wrongly acquitted of the crimes and everything. And um, the reason why I know that was wrong is because her attorney, um, you know, that defended her, went and wrote an article saying, no, that's not what happened, this was all happened. And I find that very upsetting that that's occurring with our DA's office and in the paper so blatant like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dorda Jensen. I live in Davis, and I came here in 1969, so I've been here a long time. Went to the East Coast for some years, but now I'm back. Uh, I wanted to tell you how I started getting involved with um, city issues um, more heavily than I had been before. Uh, I live in West Davis, um, right uh, across the fence from the corner of Shasta and Arlington. And at that um, that intersection, a young person from UCD was run over about two years ago. And so uh, it was a very sad thing, and, and the same day, or um, it happened in the evening, so the next morning, and all through the next month, um, the students would come and they would leave flowers uh, right in the green belt there, and they would um, leave lit candles. And I lived like 10 or 15 feet away on the other side of the fence, and uh, it was really dangerous. You know, the lit candles and the, dro the heavy canopy of the, um, of the pine needles there. And so every day I thought, okay, I'll be respectful, I'll go out and I'll, well, the first day I saw it and I said, I called the police, and they, one of them came by and said, oh, I hate to have to do this. And he knelt down and blew them out. So then I thought, okay, well, I won't call the police every time. I'll just go out there and blow them out when I see them because it's just so dangerous at night and we're all, you know, five or six houses there. And we had a fire there uh, 10 years before from a lit match that ignited some pine needles and then continued on and destroyed half of a, a little cottage. So um, what happened was um, I just kept on being, you know, mindful and blowing them out. But after a while, I was getting kind of mad about it. And then um, I tried to work it out with the city and uh, to find out whose land it was and, and stuff, but I wasn't getting very good answers, I thought. So um, the way it affected me was that it just um, made me very frustrated with the city government, but you know, I was meeting people and talking to people. And finally, uh, what happened was um, uh, I talked to the, the band, the university band, because this kid had been, been with the band and a lot of his friends were the one her friends were the ones that were doing it. And I just told the band person on the phone, hey, we had a fire here before, and uh, it's just so dangerous. And then mostly the stuff stopped. So um, why are you saying this is a story about discrimination? Well, I was just one person, and they were many. And I was alive, and they were mourning a dead person. And it wasn't very um, politically correct for me to say, hey, would you step in and, and make it safe you know, for me and my neighbors and all the animals in our homes and everything? But um, so I learned something about um, power uh, during that uh, interchange. And uh, it turned out well, you know, um, no, there aren't any more lit candles and um, stuff, but, um, and I met people and I'm still interacting, but uh, I just, it was a good way to um, find out what you need to do, which is to say, hey, who do I talk to so I can get this pro pro problem resolved? So I just uh, wanted to share that with you, and um, so here I am two years, two years later at a nice meeting, and uh, hope you're all having a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Please. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob White from the city of West Sacramento. I'm going to give you a little background about myself. I am a former Navy person. I served in the military. I was an air traffic controller for the, for the Navy. I got out and I became a Correctional Peace Officer for the state of California and served honorably in that capacity. 
and then I was medically retired from some serious injuries. But anyway, at any rate, I moved to West Sacramento in 2008. I bought my home there and lived there peacefully, quite fine and easily for approximately until 2012. And there started to be disturbances around my home. And the disturbance was because of a business. And I said, okay, well, maybe somebody has to run a business out of their home. They need some during the recession. I'll be patient. Then another business, not only next door to me, this one was directly behind me, came soon. And it started the same type of noisy business. And uh, if you know the business is good to have daycares in the community, having two of them on your home all day with all the noise is just too much. So I began to uh, call code enforcement, complain to the city. Well, ultimately, the city didn't like my complaining once I started writing letters to the assembly, uh, assembly member, uh, Roger Dickinson at that time. And so they decided that they were going to use the West Sacramento Police Department. This is the police department that had the rapist and has also had numerous civil rights violations against them. They said they're going to use this police department to shut me up by creating a false statement in a civil report and even wrote me down as a 5150 case. This is a criminally, criminally insane person that if any officer shot them down in the street, once that 5150 was discovered, there would be no investigation. There would be no further reason to investigate. This person is obviously insane, right? Because they put this on this report with my name on it. I have tried to contact the DA's office DA Jeff Risling is not interested in pursuing crimes against citizens by municipalities. He's only in doing the other opposite direction. If it's a crime against the, that the citizen has committed, then he will pursue that vigorously and very quickly. So oh, let me just say, I don't like having to complain about anything. And this is the type of person I am. I do not like that. That's not my lifestyle. I'm a Rotarian. I give to the community freely. I've uh, done it all my life, and I, I love it. I love it. And I help and aid children in everything that I do. I think that's the best way to be. And in fact, that's why I'm speaking up, because I don't want future generations of young people and children going through the same thing. I don't want our veterans coming back to the United States, of, of veterans of color or, or of any nationality, having city municipalities function in this manner. It is not American, and it is not the way of our future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Do I push the button? How you guys doing? My name is Frankie Woods. I'm the executive director of Future Development Youth Center. Um, I was also one of the coaches at Davis High when the noose was hanging on the the um, goalposts, thank you. So um, I woke up, you know, we woke up to that and it was a reality that these kids, you know, they're starting off young and they're mm -hmm. subject to uh, this discrimination and this threat, you know. We had a majority of black coaches for the first time ever and um, it was very, a frightening moment at the time. So uh, I'm just gonna keep it brief, but um, I'm all for, what we could do, you know, what's the positive change, and I say we start with the youth, and we start, we start from there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Martinez. I was a victim of a malicious, intentional, oppressive act by a public safety officer belonging to the city of Davis by the name of Joshua Helton, who caused my accident and left me there on the ground without providing me with any type of emergency response. And when I asked who he was, he stated that it was an emergency and left me on the ground. I don't know why I wasn't afforded the services in this community. I don't know if it's whether I am seen as being inadequate for services belonging to this community, whether it be my race, my facet of life, or whatever it may be. 
All I know is I was hurt very bad and I suffered a severe injury in which I just had surgery. I had to deal with this a whole year and my family was drugged through this. My children were dragged through this. I was basically depriving them of being able to give to them as a father because I was rendered defenseless by a public safety officer that says on a vehicle to protect and serve. Where, where was those services and where was the protection on the night of this incident? And then he doesn't report this to the agency. He waits about 14 days to fabricate the report. You know, I asked him for his identity and he left that out of the report. And I'm just so hurt by this and it is my duty to abreast the community of what happened because I feel if I don't, it's going to happen to someone else. And I, I can't allow that. I feel I have a sense of responsibility to inform those that want to hear. I understand it is not correct to, to say that there are times where public safety officers are not the most truthful as people. You know, and it's unfortunate to say that because we as a community emphasize the trust we put in our officers. And for them to lie about something so minute, so tedious, all you had to do was get on your mic, get on your walkie talkie and say, a pedestrian is down. Can you help him, please? If you had an emergency, I understand. But why leave me on the ground when I ask you, who are you? I, I just cannot understand any of this on how it happened. I want to understand. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here to ask questions. That's why I'm here to inform you guys. Maybe a, a few of you guys might have experienced something maybe not of that nature, but maybe of other nature, you know, regarding police misconduct, because that's what I feel this was. You know, I understand that, you know, like I said, society puts such a big emphasis in our community public safety officers but the law is the law, and you cannot sabotage the law to cover up laws that are broken by public safety officers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Tia Will. My story is very different from what you've heard, but I want to share it to illustrate just how complex cases of discrimination can actually be and to show how I got brought up to speed on how discrimination is definitely still with us. So I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I was on call at the hospital when I was called to the room of a pregnant woman who was an avowed white supremacist. The reason she had me call to the room was because she was refusing a blood draw that was necessary for her health and that of her unborn child. She was refusing the blood draw because the phlebotomist was African American. Now the phlebotomist did not know that. The patient had merely told her that uh, she wanted to speak to the physician before she had her blood drawn. So I inquired of her why that was the case and she related to me that she felt that if I would not enter into her chart an order saying that only Caucasians were to participate in her care, that it was she that was being discriminated against. She did not see this as hate. She didn't see it as discriminatory. She explained to me that it was like a religious belief for her. Well, I explained to her that I couldn't do that, but what I did do was to request that the Caucasian nurse that was assigned to her that day do the blood draw, well within the nurse's scope of practice. Unbeknownst to me, in the meantime, an African-American nurse who is there sees this as a racist request on my part, and instead of talking to me about the issue, calls the Sacramento Bee and reports the racist physician. So there is multiple groups involved feeling that they're being discriminated against. Um, I leave it to you to decide which actions were actually racist and which were actually discriminatory. But what it pointed out to me is that racism is clearly alive and well and has many complexities. Thank you. Thank 
you for sharing. Anyone else? Yes, please. Hello, my name is Douglas Samea Reed. Please don't judge me, I'm from Woodland. Although actually, I'm a transplant to Woodland, so I'm not technically a Woodlander. But one thing I don't understand, it's not my point, is I really don't understand it, we need to break the silence on this too, is why is there such hostility between Woodland and Davis? But that's not my point. Um, my point is something that we need to break the silence on. It is something that puts every single one of us in this room on exactly the same level, no matter what gender we are, no matter what race we are, no matter anything, any religious background, anything at all. And this is why are we so willing to turn a blind eye to the needs of the dying, to discrimination against the dying. My wife was a metastatic breast cancer patient. She was a quadriplegic. She had over 30 tumors in her lungs and her spine was broken into three pieces. Cancer left her totally paralyzed, but able to feel every drop of pain. She was also hypersensitive to all medications, almost all medications, um, but the liquid morphine, what they call Roxanol, she couldn't take it because it would put her into a coma. So we had a hospice locally and there are multiple hospices, I'm not gonna get into who it is, but they came in and they insisted that she be rolled on her side. Now, anybody with any common sense would know if you have masses of tumors in your lungs and have problems breathing and your spine is broken into the three places and you have spinal cord compression in two of those, T12 and C7 vertebrae, if any of you are medically inclined, you can't do that. That person is going to go into respiratory arrest and die. She did because they came out and they said because she wouldn't turn, because she wouldn't allow them to turn her so they could look at her back, that they revoked her contract, which is a, a felony violation of the law, and said that she had to sign a new one, so did I, as her husband, because they were not going to do anything to help her, they were not going to, the quote was, we will not lift a finger to help you in any way whatsoever unless and until both of you sign this contract in our presence and before we leave this room. They gave us an hour to discuss it while they sat in our bedroom and watched us. I, went, I won't go any, any further. She passed away. She passed away in the hospital in my arms. But they tried to take her body from us. When she passed in the hospital, I have a letter from the, from the hospital. It took me a year to get it from them but they tried to take possession of her remains. Why? I don't know. I went to the police. The two officers that I told were crying. Then they said, there's nothing we can do to help you. You have to go to the district attorney. I went to the district attorney. I had all my legal information, did all my research. This is after she passed away. And I took it to them. They said, give us two weeks. I gave them two weeks. I called them a week later because I was getting anxious. Um, Two weeks later, they finally called me and they said, um, sheepishly, they said, uh, you can't prove that she suffered or suffered enough for us to take action. And the rest of, of what you have are misdemeanors, so there's nothing we can do for you. I went to the state legislature. I te testified before the state legislature. They looked at me like grieving husband and the, uh, the head of the board said, um, it'll get better. And I'm thinking, when's that gonna happen? But it just goes on and on and on. And every one of us in this room is likely to have some form of discrimination as you lay dying, because the reason that I believe, this is my opinion, but the reason that I believe that all of this happened is because her case was so complex that the nurse that we originally had in the hospice said she wanted to have help. She wanted to share the burden with another hospice nurse. She was immediately removed by nine o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. And we got another person who said, it's my way or the highway, and didn't show up for 12 days. So every one of us is potentially looking at this kind of discrimination and I just wanted to ask the question, why are we so willing to turn a blind eye? And it's not just hospice. Mm -hmm. 
It's when we, we put the dying in a separate room in the hospital, when we don't want to talk about somebody who's dying or we say that they had a good life and we ignore anything else. All these things, why do we do that? We need to break the silence. Thank you very much. All right, we could probably have time for one more person before we do a wrap up. Yes, please. Do you want to do it from over there? Yeah. Oh, let me get you a... Oh, okay, thank you. I'll take just a minute. My name is Cecilia Escamilla Greenwald, and I'm past chairwoman of the Davis Human Relations Commission. I happen to be chairwoman at the time when the commission was disbanded because we were bringing forth um, issues. We were having meetings for people in the community, and they were filling up rooms, 150, 200 people, talking about incidents that had occurred where they felt they were being profiled. <clears throat> we bring it forward now to where we are today, and I believe we are on the path towards healing our community. So I'm asking you all to come on Tuesday. It's very important for you all to participate and to hear the plan and what we've been through over the last 15 months. Assistant Chief Pytel is going to um, lay out the plan to the city council and to members of the community. And it's important, the people that were on that committee, because we didn't come willingly, as Rick Gonzalez, uh, former chair of the Human Relations Commission mentioned, and Tansy Thomas, I see her out here too. Um, we've seen these incidents happen again and again over the years, and people come together and say, we're gonna do something, we're gonna do something. And we have meetings, but what comes of it? What's different this time is that there's a plan in action. There's a plan in place to address these issues. And I really hope that people attend and participate. And what's unique about this is that it's not going to necessarily be perfect, but it's a start. It's a very, very good plan, and it's a fluid plan. So we can look at it, we can modify it as time goes on, but it's something that's going to put us on a very good path towards addressing these issues in the community. What really gives me good hope is the different groups of people we have represented up here. We have the police department. We have Raheem Reed from the university. We have the school district represented here, and we have the Board of Education. The reason that's important is because we have all these different components, but the most important part is you, the community, because if you don't buy into this, if you don't help us with this, it won't work. And um, Raheem, what I wanted to say, as a student at UC Davis, you know, I graduated from there years ago, I recall incidents where there were students in various groups who were either the victims of various hate crimes or may have participated in hate crimes. And so I'm very happy to see that at the university, they have a plan together to address it. And my hope is that in the future, the university and the community of Davis can work together so we don't have to have this differentiation between the city of Davis and the university, because we all live in the Davis community. So I'm hoping we can do that in the future so we have some kind of restorative justice component at the university. But I just wanted to thank you all for being here today, because this is a very, um, um, for me, it's a very important moment personally, because of what we've been through, but I think as a community, it's very important because we are on the right path towards healing these issues. These issues aren't gonna go away, as you know. Rick, Tansy, others, they're not gonna go away, they're here, but what's different is how we choose to address them. And so I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Can you just uh, maybe remind everyone what time on Tuesday? She asked me to remind everybody on Tuesday. It's at the city council meeting, and it's going to <laughs> Kelly Stackowitz, <laughs> our assistant city manager. Um, what time will it be on the agenda, approximately? It's on the agenda for 8:30, but that's approximate. Okay, approximate 8:30. So you might want to be here a little bit early. And if you aren't able to be here to watch it, at least you can maybe give some comments during public comments at 6:30, and then you can watch it from home on uh, DC TV Channel 5. All right, great, thank you. Yes? It's eight o'clock? Okay, so hold on, uh, I wanna just do a wrap up for this time period right now, and then we'll take uh, about five, 10 minute uh, break for those who need to leave. The program was uh, 
advertise till three o'clock, so if you have to leave, you can leave. And those who want to stay and continue an informal conversation, we will remain in this room to do just that. And so I just want to give uh, just a few minutes time for our panel to just kind of give a response and, and closing comments. Anyone wants to start? In, okay, thank you. Let me start and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, in the back of the room, uh, right uh, under Mr. Greenwald, uh, right over his head, is a, a statement that I will ask each of you to take a look at on your way out. It's actually a principles of one community statement, which we put together uh, several years ago, which is to try to create a sense that we are one community. It's uh, signed by members of the Davis Human Relations Commission, the city council, I believe, uh, leadership from the Davis Joint Unified School District and leadership from the University of California, Davis. So we, we, we are all in this together and I appreciate the last remarks about us coming together as one community. Uh, secondly, the other point I'll mention is that a lot of the work and programming efforts and initiatives that we're looking at uh, deal with uh, an issue that has come up here uh, time and time again, and it's, it's understanding microaggressions. Um, it's easy to understand basic discriminatory overt practices and the like, and most of the time we avoid them and, and people avoid actually committing those kinds of acts. But what happens a lot in our society nowadays are what we call microaggressions, those subtle uh, 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 assaults on your dignity. Uh, you're aware of them, you, you feel it, you know what they are. They go across all the different lines of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation and the like. And a lot of times because someone right next to you doesn't say anything about it, you, you want to question yourself as to, did that really happen to me? Did, did, did they really just slight me? Did they really just, you know, because no one else is willing to step up. But I think one of the things that we've recognized in, on our campus is this issue of positionality. That a lot of times these microaggressions occur with people in a sort of a, a leadership or a supervisory position or authority position to you in a, a less powerful position. There's a power differential in that relationship and that a lot of times is where that microaggression really starts from. So on campus, we're trying to develop the kind of training for managers and supervisors and leaders in position of authority. It could be the police department as authorities, could be teachers in a high school, it could be you name it. But for people to understand, those people have a special responsibility to both understand what microaggressions are so that they themselves don't commit it, but also more importantly, to be able to recognize when microaggressive behavior is occurring in their climate, where they're at, so they can stop it and address it there before it goes on. And that's one of the areas that we think we can do some research and some training for our entire community in. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll pick up on uh, what uh, Raheem Reed just said in terms of some of the examples that I heard of microaggressions just talking to uh, teachers and families are, you know, the simplest question of like, oh, where are you from? Um, often well, I heard, you know, it's the children of color at the high school, people ask them that as if they're not from Davis. They're not part of our community. Um, you must be from Woodland. Right? I mean, that's, that's the, the implication. And, and, and so I think this idea of the microaggression is the simplest ways that we have of talking to each other that tell us, that send these signals of who we are and who belongs and who's uh, um, from somewhere else. And I was really, really moved uh, by Mr. Martinez's testimony. And, and um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And this kind of feeling of, well, we have these public services and public servants, but being written out of the polity. Um, and, and this idea that, I, you know, especially when we say we are one and, I, and you're still getting the signal of not belonging. Um, and, and, and the other um, uh, piece of Mr. Martinez's testimony that really moved me was when you're saying you don't understand, you just want to understand. And I think even in Tia Will's commentary too, just saying, I wish that we had talked uh, the nurse had talked to you, and and I, I think that it's these kinds of fora that, that, that get us together to talk, to sec say that these are very complicated 
issues. And, um, and we're all maybe, let's assume best intent. We're trying to do our best, but there are major repercussions uh, by our actions. And so I think that, well, what are some of the ways we can get at that to share more? Um, but also restorative justice. So if Mr. Martinez had had access to something like that, where we and, and even Tia in your story, something like that, where we're sitting down and 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 trying to understand where the other person is coming from, and and I and I thought that was so beautifully illustrated in Teresa Geimer's comment. If everybody could be like you in terms of really engaging that person sitting next to us, the stranger on the bus, and hearing their stories and not writing them off and, and, and taking it, internalizing it and thinking, well, what it, I don't want to be the person that's causing my, this, this person to feel that way. What could I possibly be doing? Um, and, and also just questioning our community. Is, is there something about our community that's doing that? Uh, and, and making, and why is West Sacramento or Sacramento a more hospitable, welcoming community? So I, um, I, I thought that that was great. I, I heard it in Dorta Jensen's comment too, in terms of recognizing the complexity of that situation she was, she found herself in, and she, she knew it wasn't politically correct to just blow out the candles, but at the same time there was a serious concern and really communicating. I think that that at the end of the day, um, what, what um, we're hearing is the importance of that and just a takeaway as, a, as a, um, a member of the school board is to what extent are we teaching that kind of storytelling, sharing, caring? How can we develop that empathy in our classrooms? Because these are the citizens of tomorrow. And, and then it was in the last story as well, Mr. Reed, um, we, are, we are a society that unfortunately is desensitized to, to the dying. Um, there is so much. We're overwhelmed by everything around us. We don't have time. We don't know how to respond. And it's just learning these skills of how to take it in, how to feel, how to understand, how to care and empathize. I think that um, there's a lot that I've already learned and, and thank you all for sharing that. And uh, I think these are things that we need to be learning in our schools too. Thank you. Jen, did you want to add? Uh, it, you, that was all said uh, beautifully. I, I agree with all of that. I think it starts very young. I think it starts in um, giving kids language to express how they're feeling, um, give them a space to do that. Um, and really uh, encourage the sharing of stories. I think it's, that's how we find out how we're affecting one another. In all the stories that were shared, multiple levels of people were impacted just by one thing. So families, um, you know, people that we're just riding on the bus with, uh, people that we work with, so many things impact all of us and if we don't talk about it, uh, it's not gonna get any better. So thank you everyone for sharing your stories. I really appreciate it. Um, and I feel, Cecilia, I feel like you wrapped it up very well at the end. I feel like um, there is hope in this room and, and I hope that we do move forward and take steps to really bring this community together and share um, and uh, make it a better space for everybody. So thank you everyone. Did you wanna add a comment? You're good? All right. Uh, okay, so just in terms of kind of ending the program, I think what we heard is the, the power of conversation and hearing people's stories um, and how that really helps create that awareness that we need to make a change to men relationships. And uh, so just in closing, just as next steps, if I can just make a suggestion that maybe there's something that you heard today and we're just about closing. Uh, if there's something that you heard today that really moved you, uh, find someone in your own community, your family, your friends, people you work with, and, and pass on the story. Share what you've learned uh, as a way of it kind of increasing that awareness. Be that, uh, that light that carries our stories out. Uh, do that. Another thing that you can do if you haven't had a chance is, is go back and visit with the organizations. Find out what, what you can do and how you connect connect with these organizations, support what they're doing. Um, and the last thing, this is an annual event and uh, the commission is gonna continue to provide these form for conversations. So we have um, short evaluations forms in the back. So take a minute, let the commission know what you appreciated about the event. If there's something that you'd like to see done differently, something that we need to revise, uh, so the event keeps getting better and better as we move forward. So three o'clock right on the dot. 
And if I uh, just want to remind you, we're going to take a 10 minute break. I want to thank the panelists again for being here today. I really appreciate your perspective. And we'll take a 10 minute break. And those of you who want to continue and, and have a more informal conversation, just come back at 10 after 3. And we'll continue this conversation until 4 o'clock. Thank you all for coming.